Welcome to Hacking the Universe. I'm Erin Worley. And I'm Philip Worley. We're so excited to be here with you guys today. We are going to be talking about trusting ourselves versus trusting the information outside of us, right? Outside information, yeah. Outside information, right? Now, we were all raised and programmed. Well, for them, it would never say never, right? There's always exceptions to every rule. But the majority of humanity was raised to trust outside information before we trust our inner yeah. guidance, our inner nudges, our, our intuition, eyes. or our own eyes, right? So what that means is we were taught in school to trust the science in the books to trust the rules of writing and reading and yeah. all of these things to trust the experts and the experts were never us the experts were always mm -hmm. those lofty peoples people with a lot of degrees and a lot of experience it was never us and we well, i don't know were... about experience but i have the degrees <laughs> doesn't necessarily well, have that experience. But, okay. That's, that's a good point. And that's often true that people that have a lot of degrees don't necessarily have experience. They have a lot of book reading, but maybe and book learning, but maybe they haven't actually done any hands on things. Yeah. Yeah. So that's true too. So anyway, though, that's what we were taught to trust is the people who wrote the textbooks we learned from in school were infallible. were always correct in those yeah. textbooks, even though they change were, it every year. <laughs> and update it and they have to fix things every year it's infallible and it's always right even even though next year things are gonna be wrong or fix them this year it's right. <laughs> yeah there's there's a lot of that going on yeah. yeah so that's how we're programmed right and we're programmed that as individuals our ability is how well can we memorize this information and regurgitate it and this really leads us to be programmed. Our minds are actually programmed just like computers now to trust what authorities tell us versus what we feel or what we experience ourselves. And this has been coming through really interestingly um, since we posted the video on the moon on the 4th of July, yeah, we had video, seen, yeah. yeah, we had seen the moon doing all kinds of interesting, crazy things. And um, we got a lot of response from that video. And thank you to every single one of you who sent us a response. We appreciate you so, so much. And that includes um, people who didn't agree with us, people who, who said, well, I don't think that this is right, because we value that everyone has their own unique perspective. And I think that that's really important. Everybody's having their own experience that's exactly right for them on their life path. And we're sharing our unique perspective that is exactly right for us on our life path. And that's a beautiful thing. So we got a, a wide variety of responses. We got a lot of people sending things in about, you know, I've been I've been taking the same walk every day, same weather conditions, same time for four months or four years. And all of a sudden, the last month, the moon's been doing things it's never done before, or the sun has been doing things it's never done before. And this, it doesn't make any sense. And I've mentioned to the other people and they brushed it off. So I was so glad to see your video because it really confirmed um, what what I was seeing myself. We got other messages from people saying, well, I haven't noticed it myself, but that's really interesting. And, you know, it's definitely possible, right? Mm -hmm. And then we got messages, well, some, so this is, this is actually normal. This is the, the way I always see the moon. And that's certainly possible with multidimensionality. You know, all of the dimensions right now are sort of converging for um, this big, shift that the earth is in so very much that's why that oh what is that thing called babe when um it's not the monroe doctrine the, the mandela effect mandela effect thank you how, thank how you. did i get that from that <laughs> 
but that's the Mandela effect is we have we have people coming together into one timeline from various different timelines and on one timeline they had been experiencing things this way and on the other timeline they had been experiencing things this way and the timelines are converging yeah. and so so they're they're saying well no it was this way and other people are saying no it was this way and they're both right and so that's beautiful too and um and, and like i recognize that yeah absolutely on different timelines you're going to have different experiences and then we had some people that said well i just googled it and wikipedia says that this is normal and that's that's great too so what's interesting is how when somebody like us comes along and says hey this really weird thing happened and we noticed it and in the past we would have said it, we must have mistaken it, right? Yeah, in the, in the past, you would have it. would have said, "Oh, I must be confused, or I remember it wrong, or you're trying to think of a rational explanation." In the past, we based would have done on that. your worldview that's been created by everything you've learned in school and everything. Like, well, obviously, all this stuff is true, and this doesn't mix with it, so I must be confused. I must remember it wrong. Maybe I saw it wrong you doubt your own eyes and your own experience as opposed to trusting your eyes and your own experience and going, okay, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm experiencing. So obviously these other things that I might've learned, believe might not be as true as I thought they were. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so in the past though, we wouldn't have. Yeah. In the past would, you would yeah. have been, you just doubted yourself. Yeah. As well as we would like, have oh, well, I must be wrong. Yeah. I obviously I'm be. wrong. You know, everything else I've, I've learned from textbooks kind of possible. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, I don't, where was I going with this? I don't know. <laughs> um, in the past, we would have doubted it as opposed to yeah. accepting what we saw. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what's interesting to me is not the people who say, well, I've seen something different my whole life. It's like, well, okay, that makes sense. We were probably on slightly different mm -hmm. timelines and our timelines are converging. That makes perfect sense. It's happening everywhere. It's one of the so big, much of that now. it's one of the big cracks in the matrix. And I want to say, man, okay. I was going to say Mandela effect. And I was thinking that was a Monroe doctrine. I'm so confused anyway. So, okay. That's what's going on with the Mandela effect. And it's really wide opening showing these cracks in the matrix that all these timelines are converging with all people kinds of have people had have different experiences. This. So it makes total sense that people have had different moon experiences and that's all true for each of us. Our experience was true. Your moon experience is true. It's all true. And we're all coming coming into one place now where we're saying, hey, my experience is different than your experience. In the past, we would have said, well, you're wrong and I'm right. Mm -hmm. But no, there's limitless possibilities. There's also multidimensionality, which means it's possible. And Phil and I have done this over and over and over again, especially the last few years since I started recognizing it. We, he has said, we something like this happened in our past we've been together for 11 years now 12 years something like that this thing happened in our past and i said no it happened this way and we're arguing back and yeah. forth and so then we both know exactly what happened yeah and we're sure we, we both are sure i wish i could remember yeah. an instance right now can you remember uh, it? we've had this a couple times yeah so where we've really really been like no i'm right i remember exactly and yeah. precisely i'm right and he's like no i'm right and different. so we asked i am and i am's like oh well it's both true you're just both accessing past information on slightly different timelines i'm like oh that's remember interesting. your memories are just a memory it's not yes. necessarily what happened it's what it's you what you're your accessing head. right now yeah, yeah. So and that that can get very, very confusing. There's yeah. so much of the quantum field that from our human perspective can feel a little bit like, ah, what's going on? But trust me, it's actually much easier to navigate than you might think at first glance. And it's actually not designed for you to need a physics degree to understand the quantum field. The quantum field is actually, it's constantly evolving. We are constantly evolving with it. The more that we trust that limitless possibilities exist and that things don't have to be the way that we were taught, the more we access more of those limitless possibilities. Do you agree? That's beautiful. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. So 
anyway, so what was interesting was, was not the people that said, well, I've had a different experience. It's like, well, of course, yes, there's so many different multi-dimensions. Of course, people are having different experiences. It was the people that said, well, I Googled it and Wikipedia said that this is totally normal. So that is, well, that's a valid perspective, right? Because it's been, it's what we have been taught to do at the same time. It's, it's saying that everybody else, that scientists and everything know more than we can access with our own senses, eyes. our own eyes and ears. So essentially, like, if you were to experience something and you said, that's such an interesting experience, I wonder if other people are having that experience. And you go and you Google it and it says, oh, nobody, that experience isn't real. You're wrong. And then you say, oh, I must be wrong. That experience must not be, be true. Yeah. Then it's like you didn't experience it. That's not that's not real. It's just imagining it, you know, there's a, yeah. there's an effect, you know, yeah. it's like, it was just the lighting, you know, don't worry about it. I'll go back to sleep. Yeah. So it's, it's really, and the more that we are stepping into this transition to new earth, the more we are being invited to trust that all is divinely led. And part of that is releasing the need to have confirmation from an expert that what you yourself experience is real because like we're saying with the mandala effect there are multiple perspectives converging in this timeline and what matters is can you trust your own experiences over mine and phil's over everybody else's over wikipedia can that's the point of all this we're sharing our interesting experiences and we bet you are having some interesting experiences too, where you're having opportunities to see cracks in the matrix, cracks in the fabric of reality. And can you trust that? The more that you trust that, the more magic and miracles will flow to you. The more that you say, no, no, it's always been that way. I don't want to explore that things are changing. The more the, the universe, not out of a, out of any reason other than understanding you're not quite ready to turn on the drip of magic and miracles starts showing you less and less of these cracks in the matrix. So right now is really just a time where we are being invited to trust our own experiences and begin to explore reprogramming our minds that it's yeah. safe to have our own experiences. So part of waking up is, starting to trust yourself and trusting your own what you're witnessing and seeing and, and believing it as opposed to running to something else go, to try to explain it away yeah because as you wake up you're going to start noticing things you never noticed before coincidences that you like are impossible and it's either you can start to trust them and, and believe that the, what you're witnessing is real or you can deny them and go like, well, I gotta go find something to explain this away. And and it's like, you're gonna go through that phase where you have to break through that and start to learn to trust what you're experiencing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's nothing more powerful than having an experience that really goes against everything that you've been taught or led to believe about this world and choosing to trust your own eyes and ears, your own senses, as opposed to running to the computer to have it proved that, oh, it's always been this way, or, or I was wrong, or I didn't see it this way. There's nothing more thrilling than trusting yourself. Like it yeah. is wild to begin to choose to trust yourself. Even if everyone around you says, no, that's not right try it try trusting yourself anyway try putting yourself as the number one decider of your experience oh my gosh it's life-changing it's really really exciting even to like that's exciting Ooh. so we've also i also want to transition into talking about decluttering
Okay. <laughs> we- <laughs> yeah, she's really into decluttering right now. Oh my gosh. Those. Guys, it's, I have to recommend it. We have a lot of stuff in our house. Well, now we have a lot of stuff in boxes to be donated. So yes. that's exciting. <laughs> yes, we do. It's good. It feels good to get rid of the stuff that you know you're not going to. You, you would not to. believe the energetic charge attached to things in your house that you're holding on to because you bought them and you feel guilty about using it, even though you actually don't like it or that you might need one day. Now, this kind actually decluttering, trusting yourself to declutter comes back to trusting the universe, trusting that you are safe, that the world is not going to fall apart on you, even though things are collapsing for the government, like we talked about on last week's episode, you are safe during this transition. And that's what I'm really, really choosing. Now, do we have some emergency food and water? Yes, we do. We have that stored, but that's that's fine. That's a different thing. I'm talking about decluttering our living space. Yeah. And also, as far as emergency food and water goes, there was a time that I was really attached to prepper channels and, and the idea of everything's going to fall apart and we need to have food for 10 years, right? I was attached to that. And now I'm really, really choosing that no, we're not going to need to store food. We still have some food stored, but we're not going to need it, that there will be enough food available for everyone during this transition. I'm choosing that. I'm choosing that. I'm choosing that. Yeah. And how does that feel to you to choose that? I feel like that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be interesting transition but it's it, right that we don't know it's not exactly going to be what's coming but it's not yeah. going to be devastating in any way i really do believe that yeah so anyway we have a lot of stuff and it turns out i have been keeping things like that i don't need at all that i don't even like or use because maybe one day i might use it and choosing that it's safe for me to release these things has just like been, wow. It's, it, it's been huge. The way our house is lifting in vibration as I choose to release these items is incredible. And I'm being ruthless about it and it's going so quickly. Um, and I, I follow this woman on YouTube. She's uh, the minimal mom, I think minimal mom, I think. Um, and, she is so good with decluttering and just watching her videos has really, really helped me. And she talks about every single thing that you own in your house is inventory that you want, that you have to manage. Do you want to spend time managing these, this thing? And so now I'm holding up, like, for example, Phil and I went to build a bear when we were early on, when we were dating and we both like star Wars. So we had a bear built a wearing yeah. a star Wars Jedi Jedi outfit. And, uh, and we really loved that bear. That was a good and, bear. And the bear was great. But then, like, when we had our own kids, like, the bear became less important to us. We really loved that bear, but then, I think. Or maybe, was it just me that loved the bear? Oh, it was, it was a cool bear. It was, it was, <laughs> it was cool a cool Jedi bear. bear yeah. yeah. Yeah, but then when we had our own like, kids. Like, joke like, about yeah. Jedi bear. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Jedi bear was our, our bear, you know. And the bear became less important. But it's still, like, I wasn't going to get rid of Jedi bear, like, how could I even conceive of doing that? Now we have like five million stuffed animals, and well, we don't. The kids, well, yeah, <laughs> the kids, <laughs> kids. Well. so anyway, Jedi bear is just one more stuffed animal, like, in the way. So, yesterday. I decided to declutter Jedi oh, bear because no. I really wanted our kids to you love got Jedi, rid of bear. Jedi bear. You didn't tell me, <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Right. I figured Jedi Bear wasn't inventory. I'll have to come to terms with this. To <laughs> oh, it felt really, really good. I have to do some grieving here. <laughs> it felt really, really good. It felt like, you know, I wanted our kids to love Jedi Bear, but they don't. They never have shown any interest in Jedi Bear at all. And so, yeah, it felt really, really good. Because they're going to love what they decide to love. Yeah. You never know what. There's so many things early on in our child journey, (laughs) journey with children, where I bought them toys that I had wished I had when I was a kid that I never received. 
And and they're not they, interested at all. They don't like any of those toys. Instead, it makes more sense to let them pick what they're actually interested in. But we had to learn that. Yeah. We had to learn that. Um, and so anyway, for example, it was a big stress to me every time we were leaving the house because I had to go through my underwear, bra, socks drawer, which is all just in one big drawer to find a pair of socks to wear that matches. And this was a huge stress to me. And so what I did was I pulled, every, I found that with decluttering, the secret for me is not taking things out one by one. It's taking the whole thing and dumping it on the floor and going through it from that space. And so there were so many socks I never grabbed because they literally have holes in them. There was underwear that I tried once. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about my underwear. I tried it once and I didn't like it. So it's been in the drawer for three years or five years because I bought it and maybe someday I'll wear it, but I don't like it. There's bras that don't fit me since I got pregnant and you know, my breasts got bigger mm. when they get bigger when you get pregnant. And so that, what am I holding on to those for? There's all these things cluttering this drawer and I went through it and I got rid of almost everything that was in there. And I, I have three little containers in there now, one for socks, one for bras, and one for um, uh, underwear. And it's so nice. Now, when we're leaving, there's no like two or three minutes stress of me trying to find this thing. Now it's just a grab and go. It's so different energetically. And I'm doing that to our entire house where everything has a place. So when you have something out, you know exactly where to put it back. And when you're looking for something, you know exactly where it is. We did that with the kids' toys yesterday, and we donated so many things. And the interesting thing is with our kids' toys is we thought that the more toys we had, the easier it would be for them to play. But actually, the more toys That's we had. true, yeah. Yeah. You got to give them limited options. Yeah. And so likely play with them. This has been a project for us decluttering, decluttering the kids' toys. Now, before the kids were born, Phil was going to a ton of garage sales to buy things to resell on eBay and Amazon to make money for us to publish One Truth, One Law. And he also encountered a lot of very, very nice toys that he could get for a dollar or two. So we had so many toys like mountains. And when we did our first toy declutter a few years ago, we dumped all the toys into the living room floor and it was literally like a mountain. It was so high. It was, mm. it was insane. And we've slowly been getting to the point that we got to last night, which was where like they only have the things they actually really enjoy and play with often and all those things the other things that we got rid of basically they played with the day they got them and then never again but for some reason it's like i just couldn't you never bear. know what it is they're gonna play yeah with. i just couldn't bear to get rid of it even though it makes it hard for them so anyway they haven't been playing great on their own because there's too many choices and now that we got rid of the choices they spent the whole day yesterday playing and they started again today taking things off the shelf and playing they're not overwhelmed anymore and even adults we can get overwhelmed by too many choices and just not choose and so Choice like overload yeah and it's a really hard thing and so it's the same thing like i decluttered my makeup i decluttered my face products all these things where i bought them i've spent good money on them and then they weren't actually what I wanted. So I used them once or twice and I didn't like how they felt or how they looked or whatever. And I've got, you know, drawers full of this stuff that I'm saving for just in case I oh, ever feel like, oh, it. I spent money on it. So yeah. I don't want to like throw it away. But then you have this thing in your life that's just taking up space that you yeah. don't like. Yeah, and it makes it hard to find the thing that you actually use. So I'm really excited. So I did the hall closet earlier today, and we did both the bedrooms. And I've actually, I've decided I'm going to declutter my crystals too. 
because I have a lot of crystals. Well, I don't, you can't see them right there, but I have a lot of crystals. And I realized that instead of buying specific crystals that I'm really, really drawn to, when I'm like in a crystal buying space, I just buy a ton of crystals. And so then instead of me really spending the time to connect in, because with crystals, we're actually supposed to connect in and actually like commune with the crystal. Instead, I'm just sort of overwhelmed by crystals. And so I'm going to be doing some decluttering of those. And I'm really excited about that. I'm excited because every room we declutter, every closet we declutter, it's like this breath of fresh air. Like I didn't know I was constricted. And it's like when you declutter it and you have only the things that you use, it's like I can finally relax. This beautiful breath of fresh air It's the energy coming into our house now that we're removing all of these extras that we don't use is, I don't know, it feels really peaceful. It feels really good. Like I'm getting really excited about being in our house. It's starting to feel more like a haven and less like a place like I have to manage and fight with. That's, I, that's a good way. It felt like we were fighting with our house, didn't it? Yeah. And it felt like the only solution was to get a bigger house. The idea of moving is not really right for us right now. And I don't know, it just, it feels really good to choose that we love this house and this house can function perfectly for us. It feels exciting. So I'm working right now. And I also, oh my gosh, the kids had, they had trashed the dresser and the bedroom. They had written with marker on it all over the place and they had put stickers on it. This was like a year ago. And I thought I was going to get a new dresser. And we had a power, a very long power outage over the weekend. And so we didn't have a lot to do. And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to clean this dresser and see it, see what I can do with it. Right. And the kids actually got really into it too. They were so excited. They were scraping off all the stickers and we were um, using the uh, generic uh, Mr. Clean magic erasers to get the marker off. And the dresser looks perfect. It looks brand new. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I would have thought that the only solution here, and it really only took us like maybe 30 minutes. It was really quick. They had so much fun. And now they also are less motivated to write on the furniture or stick stickers on the furniture. And I'm like, oh my, it's so like, it's a perfectly good dresser. I don't know. It's, so it's like the, the problem wasn't the dresser. And this is the same dresser that my underwear and socks are in, right? The, the problem was I had more things that I wasn't energetically feeling safe to release. And once I energetically felt safe to release them, the dresser cleaned itself. Of course, we did the cleaning, but it felt really good. It actually felt fun. We enjoyed it. And the dresser organized itself. That felt good and enjoyable too. Like I never thought releasing things would feel so fun, but it feels really fun. Phil, Phil has some things he's probably not ready to release yet. Are you ready to release everything? Oh, no. No, no. You want to tell us about some of the things you don't want to release? I don't know. No. And this is interesting. So I noticed in my perusal of uh, YouTube videos on decluttering and minimalism, and it's not like I'm trying to be minimal. I'm just trying to have a space for everything so I don't feel overwhelmed by all the things that we own anymore. Um, so... What I have noticed is that for most couples or families, there's usually one spouse that's all like gung ho, like, let's declutter everything. This is incredible. And then there's one spouse that's like, don't touch my stuff. Back off. <laughs> so it's actually really, really uh, normal, I think. And what's interesting is I found that from watching these videos that usually the spouse that's like, don't touch my stuff after a time, they're like, you know what? I think I'm going to go through my stuff because the house starts to feel so good to them energetically in all the places that have been decluttered and they start finding their spaces to feel really overwhelming. And they start having that desire to have that same peace and tranquility they feel in the other spaces and their space as well. So I don't know if, if you've ever thought of decluttering that your spouse isn't on board. I, I just feel like, yeah, like I'm 
Phil has a lot of collections of things and I'm totally supportive of that. And if he wants to declutter those at some point, he can, but if not, it's his space, you know? So it's totally cool. I love you. <laughs> all right. Love you. But for all of the common areas, I am decluttering everything. So anyway, in the kitchen, I'm so excited about this. Can you guys tell how excited I am? Like, I cannot wait to get back in the kitchen and do some decluttering. Like, oh my gosh, yesterday I threw out, so I'm doing one cabinet a day in the kitchen because if I were to like look at the whole kitchen and all the cabinets, I would probably explode. I'd be like, never mind, backing, yeah, backing out slowly, <laughs> backing slowly out of this room. I, I quit. So anyway, I'm doing one cabinet a day and I did a cabinet yesterday and there were quite a few like stale old items, like stale crackers, um, stale cookies, stuff like that, that like literally you wouldn't eat. So why? Do I not just routinely throw them out? Instead, whenever I open that cabinet, I look and I say, that's not good anymore. Don't eat that, right? Don't give that to the kids. Sometimes, like if it's it was like a stale package of crackers, sometimes I'll be like, oh, I better open up a new box of crackers. But I'm leaving the stale ones there. Like, what? What? Why would you do that? I don't know. So anyway, that felt so good. And today I'm going through our vitamin and medicine cabinet. Oh, oh my gosh, you guys. Well, that needs to be gone through. Well, it's not. It's, so it's actually a cabinet in our kitchen where because we, we have so many like supplements and things that we take. So this thing is a disaster zone. It's such a mess. And the really interesting thing is there's everybody recommends fulvic acid. It's like so we have tried it in a few different forms. We tried pills, we tried the drops, and we tried, um, there's like a little like tarry substance that's full of fulvic acid. Anyway, it made us really sick. We actually felt like we were dying. And we've like done, we have done a lot of supplements and vitamins and a lot of different natural things we've tried on ourselves. And so we understand what a detox reaction is. This And we thought in the beginning that this was a detox reaction where um, the body was processing out some of the things that this supplement was clearing through you. And so sometimes when you're starting a new supplement, you can experience a detox reaction for a few days where you might have a headache or feel kind of sluggish. And at first we thought it was a detox reaction, but then we realized not, this thing is actually killing us. Yeah. My guidance was, was coming poisonous. through. <laughs> very, and so like everybody recommends fulvic acid. So I don't know if we're just not, we were trying to find the best brands and everything. So I don't know. But I, I wouldn't yeah, be able to recommend that like, I don't know what's going anybody. on. People yeah, just swearing by this weird. thing. Like, like both yeah. of us, it was, yeah. it was quite clear we were being poisoned. Yes. And so, it's like, oh, we got to get off this or we're going to die. Here's the crazy thing, guys. I am taking all of, like I said, I dump everything out and then I go through things one by one and figure out how to put it back up. So I'm taking everything out. We have like five bottles of the fulvic acid pills. We still have the container of the fulvic acid tari stuff and we have two dropper bottles of fulvic acid we decided like six months ago this fulvic acid was killing us and we would stop taking it why do we still have all of the bottles yeah. of it because we yeah. don't throw anything out no it's nuts energetically this makes no sense coming from the perspective and of an energy worker and energy healer when we reckon when we try something there's nothing wrong with trying things right but when we try something and then we say you know what this isn't a fit for me beautiful the best thing that we can do to keep our energy really in alignment and really flowing is to then release that thing which would mean in the, in the case of supplements, especially something that gave you a bad reaction, you wouldn't want to donate that. You, you throw it in the garbage, right? But we didn't do that. We left it in our cabinet. Like, what? What? Are you kidding? Can you, like, energetically, I'm shocked. I'm shocked at myself. <laughs> this is what I've been doing. So I'm so excited to just go through our houses. Just, I, I can feel it vibrating higher. I can feel myself literally changing on a cellular level during this process. So I so, so, so much recommend it. And also that Minimal Mom YouTube channel has been so helpful to me in sort of giving me the courage to get started and showing me how to actually do this. Um, let's see, what else did we declutter that was interesting? You offered me that book. That was a little oh. thing. I was like, what? 
Yeah. Okay. So, so she got this book in the mail. It was not the book she ordered. Somebody sent her the wrong book. It was Amazon. So she, it was Amazon sent her the wrong book. book. So she kept the book, which I don't know why. I thought and maybe it came to me divinely. That, may, that makes sense. That's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. So she tried to read it for like a year. She's she's she she comes to me. She's like, "Do you want this book? I've been trying to read it for a year. I can't get past halfway. Do you want it?" And I'm like, "Why would I want that?" No, that is a good point. Now, this I'm very specifically not gifting things to people. It's either going in the garbage or it's being donated. Period. I'm not doing the thing where I'm saying, oh, my mom or my cousin could use this. Let me ask them if I want that. Because if I do that, I'll never get through the house. And the other thing is, so often when we bought something, we do not feel safe releasing it. Um, and so we say, well, if I give it to somebody I love, then I'm not really, I didn't waste the money, right? Let's just but still kind of holding on to it. Yes, place. it's right. It's, it's saying, well, they'll have it. So if I ever need it, I could just ask to borrow it from them, right? That's not what I was doing here specifically. What I was doing is Phil, okay, Phil's like favorite thing is to go to thrift stores and buy books. He looks for a specific kind of book. He's looking for bestsellers. He mm -hmm. is, Phil is an author and one day he's going to be famous. He's absolutely Thank brilliant. <laughs> I love him so much. I think he's the best. And so I thought, yes, well, he's good always. Books. I'm okay. looking that hopefully there'll be a book that I'm like, yeah, oh my God, but, this is amazing. But you're if you've is... already read it and you know it's not good, then because <laughs> I trust your judgment. I'm not going to be like, well, Aaron thought it was terrible, so it's probably amazing. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, Aaron thought it was terrible, it's probably not very good. Yeah, I just have really <laughs> so... good taste in books. She does. Yes, she I have does. great taste in books. Thank you for saying that. So here's the thing, though. Part of Phil's thing is he's he's just so he's reading books, right? Because he's decided that reading books will help make him an even better author. And so, yeah, so like his part of his thing is he's decided that when he chooses a book and he starts reading it, he has to finish it. And so like you just read the picture of Dorian Gray or I said picture. I said picture. You there's a picture, there's yeah. a Mandela effect. Okay, we are sure that it well, was it, a portrait of Dorian Gray. Well, it is picture of Dorian Gray now. Yes. So, so yeah, it used to be the portrait of Dorian Gray. Mm -hmm. But now it's the picture. So that's another Mandela effect. You can yeah. look it up. And I can like prove this. Like I'm not the only person that thinks this because I've gone on Google. You can go on Google and type in the picture, yeah. and the number one result that people are searching is. Or the, the portrait, if you type in the portrait, is the portrait of Diane Grant. Mm -hmm. Same thing on Amazon. It's like, why are millions of people And in the book itself, this? it talks about a portrait, not yeah. a picture. Yeah. So it's, anyway, it's so that's interesting. Anyway, we can go on and on about Mandela. Oh, it's so interesting. And, so and interesting. people will be like, oh, no, you remember this wrong. You're just confused. But then you can go back and look and find all these little references that show that, yes, it actually yeah. was this way. Yeah. Like, um, Is the timelines converge. Yeah, was it the Star one. Wars? Um, now in Star Wars, I don't know if you, you remember that this famous scene in Star Wars where Luke finds out that Vader's plot spoiler Luke finds out that Vader's his father, and Vader says to him, Luke says, No, Luke, I'm your father. And well, see, now to me, movie, I know that there was no no for me. That's the timeline weird. I'm accessing. The past timeline is it was Luke, I am your father. Mm -hmm. Phil is accessing no Luke, I am your father. And this is a movie we've yeah. seen like 500 times. Mm -hmm. He's accessing no Luke, yeah. I am your father. And what is the Google saying? Now, now everything on the internet and videos of uh, the, the movie say, no, I am your father. There's no Luke. Which is nuts. It's like what? crazy. Like, everybody remembers Luke. I'm your father. Like, Except for people famous... that came from that other timeline. Apparently. <laughs> but but if people are like, oh, no, you remember that one. But we found actual evidence that it was. I have a book. I can, I can go get it. I just I got a book. I have it on my desk. So the evidence is happening because the timelines are converging. So we're actually having evidence from multiple timelines that have multiple slightly different choice points. That's all. Show them right the here. cover of okay. the books. They so this is the Empire Strikes Back storybook. This was printed in 19, I think 1980 or something. So this is right after the movie came out. 
has all these pictures from the film in it. And in the storybook, here we are. We have the scene. We have the famous scene where Luke finds out Vader's his father. And where is it? Uh, join Luke, you back. Oh, we're here. Right here. I say, ah! Yeah, you had it. You had it. Uh, oh, here we go. No, Luke. Is it up there? Yeah. No, Luke. I'm your father. Yeah. It says, no, Luke. I am your father. So all these people telling me that I'm crazy, that like, oh, no, you're remembering it wrong. He never said Luke. He just said, I'm your father. And I am this is what and I am accessing the timeline where it says, Luke, I am your father, and there's no no in the beginning. Yeah. So it's it's really interesting. Okay, so the picture of Dorian Gray. The whole mm -hmm. time Phil's reading it, he's saying, this book isn't any good. Hopefully it gets better by the end. So he is choosing to read books from start to finish just to see a sort of like, why do people like this, even if it's not Well, it's good. because... So many people say it's the best book they've ever read, that it's the best book ever written. So and like, nobody well, says that about the book I donated. So I see no. your point. So why so would I, yeah. you know, but so well, I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to step back. Because many times people have said things are amazing. I didn't believe it, but I was like, okay, I'll check it out. And then I found out they were right. You know, there's been albums, musicians that I thought, oh, these are terrible. And then be like, no, they're, they're amazing. And I checked it out and I was actually like, oh, well, they're actually, this is actually pretty cool. You know, so I thought, well, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to finish the whole thing, find out people say this is the best book ever written and see what I think. And oh my gosh, that, that was one of the worst books I've ever read. <laughs> God, I, it was, man, it was only 109 pages, but like I read a thousand page books that were quicker than that thing. Oh my God. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> So it was hard. It was hard to get through. <laughs> and then yeah. Phil wrote and the I'm most wondering. amazing Amazon review to tell you people. <laughs> was it oh, I was scathing. And I don't usually learn Amazon reviews, but I'm like, I I looked on Amazon. Is anybody else that feels what, the way your I do? Review was so, I forgot to tell you this. I read your you review. Did? Yeah, no, I read no. your review and I was I was like, oh my gosh, Phil, you should start a you're reading all these books. Mm. You should start a blog oh. where you write a review of because like that review was so entertaining and it was so spot on. Oh, you should you. do that. I didn't even know you read it. Yeah. I didn't I was, know it was posted on it Amazon. Was really, yet. It was really? so like entertaining. She it was really it. an enjoyable review. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, with all the books you're reading, you could write a review after I'm everyone. You should. I forgot yeah. to tell you that I thought that. I Okay. You should. Oh my gosh. But now I'm wondering, like, how this book was so bad. It's like, how could everybody think this is the best book <laughs> ever right, written? Like out. So I'm like, <laughs> is this another Mandela effect? Did I read a different book than them? Like, like seriously, because my mind is blown. Like, how could anybody think this is the best book ever written? Like, how many books have they read? Oh my gosh. You know? Phil should, now, normally, he, like Phil is like spot on about books. He has a great sense about books, and he usually enjoys most of these books he's reading because he's specifically going after like amazing books, right? So I think, okay, Phil should start a blog writing book because <laughs> book you're right. reading all these books, babe. Yeah. All right, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You could start. You could just post that Amazon review as your first blog post. It's certainly long enough. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I, was I was like. <laughs> So on Amazon, it's all like it nobody so else thinks what I'm thinking. I'm like, this is so bad. <laughs> well, this is so this is actually this ties right back to the beginning of our video. So often this happens where people have their own opinion of something, but this thing is like really famous and really popular and everybody else loves it. And so They'll they doubt keep they, they doubt their own opinion and say, oh, maybe I'm just not smart enough to get it. And I think that's yeah. what's going on with this book because it's written, it's written in a way that is like so pretentious. Like he's trying to sound really, really super brilliant, smart, and the things he's saying don't actually mean anything. But it's but it sounds really smart, but when you think about it, like it doesn't actually mean anything, you know. And it'll go on and on and on. And that's why it was so such a hard read because it was like so ridiculously like i should, read you some some parts of it and you were like yeah. what you know i'm reading this i'm thinking is this one of the seconds. cases oh 
Is this one of the cases where people just doubting themselves? Yeah. We're going to get Phil's review up as a blog post and we'll link it down below. <laughs> We're going to start his All blog. Right. You guys can help. Leave a comment on Phil's blog post. All right, cool. <laughs> All right. Sending you guys so much love and we'll see you next week. Goodbye.